Welcome, Michael. Such a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you, Katie. I appreciate the, the opportunity. And yeah, can't wait to speak to yourself and, and your listeners. It's such a fascinating area that you focus on, because I know that you work a lot with career transition. And having myself gone from an engineering background into coaching, public speaking, podcasting, what I do now, I find that career transition is particularly relevant. So I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on this. I suppose it all begins with why did you choose to specialize in career transition and why is this topic close to your heart? Absolutely. Um, I mean, f first, yeah, it's been your journey is interesting in, in itself. And I, I think we, we kind of spoke about this previously on in different places. But yeah, for, for me, it was similar to yourself, really. I, I had a few things in terms of my own career transition piece. And that's why I feel so kind of um, I suppose so strong about it in terms of helping other people having whatever you want to give the term awakening or just a, a, I suppose an alignment to their true selves and all, whilst all those sound like buzzwords I suppose hopefully my story kind of uh, story kind of puts into 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 practice so I you know I, I went out into the, the big wide world my my mum is Jamaican uh, so uh, she was born in Jamaica my dad is from East London uh, in Hackney so very much kind of a working class background um, I would be what you call a second uh, generation immigrant so I was born in the UK as opposed to my mum and basically hard work and kind of work ethic is like just just the norm basically you can't you know there's no excuse in that and from that space and it's only through the coaching that I have and continue to have to this day I have a bit of a self-awareness about my initial direction was all about money. So it's all about money, not necessarily for materialistic possessions, but a sense of security, a sense of stability. And I still have a bit of that today, if, I, if I'm kind of honest with yourself. So from that, that kind of uh, changed, I suppose, my direction of career. So I went to accounting and finance, the business world, as that's what I thought would be the best way possible. Um, actually changed my degree in my second year to business management. And it's only with hindsight, that fascination with people, I can join the dots up but I didn't, didn't quite twig at the time. Still went into an accounting or financial industry uh, role after university, so I didn't twig that this might not be the, the right thing for me. Um, but then after a few different circumstances, I was very lucky that I actually fell into the NHS, which is the, the National Health Service in the UK. Um, and from there, that's where I really found a home for myself. I mean, I was there for kind of six years, um, basically got promoted every single year so kind of start in a graduate role then a team leader operational role then a more project manager and then more strategy kind of management um and loved the journey it's some of the best years of my life I actually did a post about it the other day about just because you leave somewhere doesn't mean you have to have resentment to that place um so so for me it was, it was a massive time in my journey I learned lots of things but near the end of that time, I would say, a couple of things happened. So I started to realize the skill set that I brought to the table and perhaps what I enjoyed and the key word, what gave me energy. So often what gives you energy can be a little sign, little kind of little whispers in your ear of what might be the thing to go down. Um, and equally, a big thing, the catalyst, I would say, was my, my dad receiving a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And um, so he had me quite late in life. And that no matter what, especially when it's a father figure, really kind of rocked me to my core in terms of, you know, you kind of look at your life, whether it's career, whatever it is, and, and kind of reflect on it. And although I don't kind of say live life like it's your last day, I think that's a bit bit too far. Um, that experience did teach me how sacred life is. Um, and I try now, I suppose, that through that, that period, I looked at my career, realised as much as I still love helping people, and I still do to this day, my current role sitting in big meetings, talking to lots of people, not seeing the operational effect, wasn't quite giving me the, the oomph that I needed. So from there, I looked into podcasts, I looked into books, I came across Diary of a CEO, um, which I don't need to introduce anymore because it, it's grown in the, the couple of years since I first watched it. Um, and he did a particular episode with a chap called Jordan Peterson, who is a Canadian clinical psychologist. And from there, it was all about self-awareness. And that's where that coaching journey started started reading books, started doing webinars, got some ICF training, and, and I'm here to where I am today. So I suppose I used that training, used that path to grow my own practice and then ultimately transition my own career. And I'm now in such a better space where I don't have the Sunday scaries. And I think for me, rather than having people rely on a catalyst like a national pandemic or a loved one passing away, my little ripple effect is can I make that happen to them right now rather than wait into a, a big life event I suppose occurs for them so that's that's the the real reason behind why I do what I do I suppose Katie. I feel that every time we choose a direction and a path to focus on it's always because it's something that affected us first and foremost 
and then we can help others because it's a journey that we went through. And you touch upon a really core point, which was around alignment. And this is one mm -hmm. of the core terms that I use when I talk about my mission to help people to lead themselves and their lives and their work with greater alignment, purpose and joy. And I think it's because alignment is really about having this clarity on what's important for you, what matters, and are you taking actions and behaving in a way that is aligned with that? Because yep. otherwise comes guilt, regret, unhappiness, tension, resentment, burnout, and the list yep. goes on. And so you touched on that key point. How do you help people to find this alignment? Because many people, they either don't know what they want or they've forgotten what they want or they know it, but they're scared to take the leap. So how do you help people to get this alignment? Absolutely. And and just when I second what you've shared, you know, I think I think you're you're absolutely spot on. And of course, different people are at different top parts of their journey. So those who I suppose know what they want to do but have a fear, I suppose tackling it is a is a different set of tools in the toolbox to, to tackle, as opposed to someone who doesn't have that, maybe that conscious awareness of what they want to do. You know, I would argue they have an unconscious awareness, but but we're, we're gonna get into that. Um for me, there's a couple couple of pieces. I think first and foremost, that energy piece is massive. I think what um you know, we have mood hoovers in the in the world or mood vampires, whatever you want to refer to them, where you leave their presence and unfortunately you feel kind of, you have that lack of energy and you, you have a big old sigh and we can apply that same thing to the task that we do. So I like to go kind of task orientated in terms of some of the things that give us energy and some of the things that take us away. It's not necessarily, um, I, get, I don't subscribe to the whole kind of, you know, make the passion your business and, and all the rest of it. But there's a as a nuanced discussion around what are the things that give you energy and interest you and how can we kind of use them as the initial signs to take that first step. So I suppose when people come to me, the first thing I do is a lot of centering and stabilizing the person. So often they are in a place of burnout or a place of lack of energy or whatever it may be. You know, um, I can refer to my wife, you know, she was in a teaching profession, you know, amazing profession, quite like the NHS, but perhaps underfunded in certain ways in, in terms of the infrastructure. So when they first come to me, they're in such a scattered frame of mind. For me, it's a lot about centering and stabilizing them um, before we can even go through that coaching journey. But once we then do that, my big piece is about values, because I honestly believe rather than pretty words on a piece of paper or just like a nice little kind of thing we chuck around like a nice buzzword, they can really be used as a practical compass for the decisions we make in life. And um, I suppose that's what I've done and ultimately how I can align myself to now future decisions. Does this align to my values? How does it make me feel that pit in the stomach that all of you will feel um, often on a Sunday afternoon? I would argue that's often linked to what I would call a value. That's just the semantics I use to describe that, that process. So for me, once we sent and stabilize someone, I mean, then target those values piece, that will start to give someone an initial direction depending on where they are on that journey. Like you said, do they know already, but they're fearful? Do they have no idea on the other end of the spectrum? And from there, once we do that, we can slowly get super practical around whether it's stuff similar to Ikigai. So in terms of the, 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 I suppose the benefit that you bring to the world, is there a financial motivator that you can obviously be paid and use this as a professional practice? It's not just a hobby. Um, and then from there, we can get even more tangible around strategy with networking with people. Is there educational gaps and all the rest of it? But that's always the very last thing. I'm always focused about who are you? And then once I know who you are, then we set your journey, your path, your definition of success, rather than jumping straight to, Let's look at a job description or two. You gave such a beautiful uh, overview of the coaching <laughs> process. First, you raise the energy. Then you help them become aware of their yeah. values, what's important for them. Once they have this awareness, find that clarity of direction through the Ikigai or Zone of Genius or any other tool that helps you to get that clarity. Once you have that clarity, you start taking the actions. And I love how you begin with raising the energy because yeah. if you're in a low state if you're burnt out if you're exhausted if you're drained if you've lost faith and belief in yourself in yeah. possibilities in the world in life <laughs> then from that place you can't find your vision and your direction and i think very often when we're feeling stuck we forget about this piece we think oh i'm feeling so stuck and low and it can be career transition can be in your current business, if you own your business, it doesn't matter. We have phases where we feel stuck and we always think, so what do I need to do or where do I need to go? First of all, we think do, which is like you said, the last thing, the action comes last, but we think, oh, what can I do about this? 
and that's last and then we think oh but where should i be going so that's the direction and like you said but first and foremost how do i raise my state and i actually went through a phase a couple of months ago energy a bit lower than normal and my coach really helped me to see it and mirror it etc and what did i do i raised my energy <laughs> and guess what then it's easy then where yeah. do you want to go oh yeah that's right i want to focus on xyz oh which action should i take oh that's right i'll just do xyz again yeah. and then it's easy but if your energy is a bit lower you can't think clearly so how do you help your clients to like you said center stabilize and raise their energy absolutely and and thank you for sharing your your i suppose your example of how because we can speak about these things we can theorize them i suppose but like your real life example of how it's actually helped so so you know i appreciate you sharing that and and for me i suppose and i'm going to use terminology that might might i can i can see my younger self rolling my eyes when i say this but for me it's all about kind of mind body and soul and it's those three key pillars um and my younger self be going oh no not mind body soul not the buzzwords michael but i'll be like hang on hang on wait 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 five seconds i'll be able to help so f for me um there's a reason why certain things in in the kind of coaching and self-development industry are often shared um some of them might be for, for other reasons, but for me, it's because I actually have a, a, an ultimate outcome and I actually help people. And they stood the test of time, I would argue. So for me, mind, body, soul, for me, especially with a, an overactive mind. So you can kind of, when, especially when I'm passionate about something, it's like a little pinball machine. It's popping all over the place. But for me to, to stabilize my center and stabilize myself before I go out into the world and put my body armor on, it's always moving my body. And thankfully, my body often links to my mind. So when I kind of um, uh, move my body, whether it, whether it exercise, it's gym, yoga. My my, uh, I'm very fortunate. My wife is a yoga teacher as well, uh, so I get get to get to uh, uh, get a few uh, free sessions every now and again. Um, but I do that through very much through the gym, where it's yoga. I play a lot of team sport. Um, that kind of exercising of the mind in the early hours of the day for me, first and foremost, allows me then to calm my mind. And then once my mind is calm, I'm then more likely to think in a strategic way. Um, rather than if you look at a pinball machine and you're trying to think in a st uh, strategic decisions, it's, you know, everything's going over. It's all noisy. It's all overwhelmed. By doing that physical activity, first and foremost, I can then be in a more logical and calm state. Um, and my soul, again, might sound quite hippy dippy to, to, to some people. I would say it's what it means to you. I often say this with a lot of things like success. What does success mean? to you soul for me is cleansing the soul whether it's um whether it's faith faith uh, faith based practice whether it's meditation whether it's journaling it's also very important to know we're all different learners some are visual learners some are more um kind of um i suppose writing down journals and stuff like that i'm very much a visual learner so i lean a lot into visualizations and meditation and i actually have a common visualization i lean into um that actually makes me cry basically every single time I do it uh, and that, that's just the, the God's truth about my future and about my children and the family and the things I hope to, to cultivate and by doing those things and keeping me in order first and foremost you know you've heard all the analogies of filling your cup up or, or putting the oxygen mask on first that allows me to be in a much more centered state um, and that's ultimately what I mean by centered state thinking calmly and thinking as your, yourself rather than letting all of the world of the social media all the dopamine I suppose knock you off course and do things as opposed to, to what people's lives want you to do as opposed to what I actually want to do myself um so for me that that's a real key piece it's not just like the the intangibles it's also the physical aspects as well and that will be completely different for every single individual that I've met and um, some jump straight into yoga some jump straight into the walks with the dogs or wherever it might be um but always ticking off that you know the mind body soul so it's a, a trifecta approach for me Yes, it's all, it always is. And there's a reason why exercising comes up all the time, why great quality sleep comes up all the time. <laughs> and this is because it works. And same, I mean, that was definitely one of the factors uh, that helped me shift my state and energy. And in general, also, I feel that one topic that doesn't come up as much, but I think is as important, maybe it would fit in, in the soul aspect, is socializing and so as a high extrovert i can be ticking all the boxes having great night's sleep exercising eating well even doing some breath work yoga meditation yeah. and i'll be okay i'll be okay like i won't be depressed but i'll be pretty good <laughs> yeah. but i won't be high 
And I get high when I go and speak at a conference. I get high after a great podcast interview. I get high when I'm meeting a friend for lunch, when I have a great socializing weekend. And I know this about myself, but you know what it is. You can know it, you know it, and you act on it, two different things. So in some phases, I forget, literally, like genuinely forget. Like I don't forget to sleep and I don't forget to eat well and I don't forget to exercise, but sometimes I forget to socialize. And when that happens, my energy goes down and then I wake up again and I think, oh, that's right. And recently, so after this happened last time, I've actually now put socializing on the same level, maybe even higher than exercise. As in, I don't allow, quote unquote, or let myself skip exercise for more than normally a few days, max a week. Why do I allow myself to do that with socializing? And so I thought this is as important for my energy. I am very extroverted. Like I often tell people, you won't meet someone more extroverted than me. Like I get all my energy through people. And so this is just super important. So I I just wanted to add that because I thought for people listening, exercise 200%, journaling, being clear on what you want, visualization, beautiful example that you shared that it makes you cry, fantastic. All of these things are super powerful and they work. But people, and even when you're introvert, people, connections, and not just your family and one or two close friends, more, more people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and and again, th- you know, thank you for sharing that. I think on that point exactly as well, you know, this also comes to about the authentic self piece. And I, we don't, you know, I'm very careful with the language I use. I don't say authentic self just as a buzzword. I say it because it's the person that's, you know, behind that mask that often people put up. And by having that socialising piece you just just shared, by taking that mask down, and I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do, but by taking that mask down and being more authentically you, you know, I, you know, I like Warhammer, Katie, you know, that's an embarrassing thing. I'm, I'm a big old nerd. People look at me. I doubt, well, they used to look at me and thought I was relatively cool. I mean, that assumption is well gone. You know, you could only ask my wife, bless her. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, you know, I love that because that's a real creative output for me. Um, I quite like music as well. I quite like physical music. Uh, I want to get into drumming and all those things. And I do that to almost feed my soul. But, by doing those things and leaning into those things, I then, funny enough, attract people with similar values, similar kind of preferences, similar similar ways of thinking. And then that doubles up. That also recharges my soul because I'm aligned with kind of people, I suppose, not necessarily just like me, but have similar ways in terms of they, they think about the world. So it's not a case of creating an echo chamber, but it's also finding people that authentically share the same passions and interests as yourself and, and feed your energy and feed your soul. And perhaps because you, like you said, you are, you know, highly extroverted. I'm sure you would still get energy from meeting perhaps any person. But I would argue when you go to those speaking events and you have people there for the same reason as you're there in terms of that self-growth and that development and that work ethic and all of those, those lovely words we want to add there. I reckon that energy doubles, triples in terms of the time when spent with those people because they're, they're aligned with ultimately your authentic self as well. Very good point. I think it's interesting to reflect on what, like you said, gives us energy, what fuels us. And I don't think any hobby or interest is embarrassing. And I you know, <laughs> also play music and sing and often singing in the street as I walk. And I also knit and I uh, paint and draw. I think it's nice to, to express ourselves creatively. But yeah, yeah. hobbies, interests, creativity, amazing, and socializing. And then the basics. I mean, the basics are really to sleep, moving the body, eating healthily, breathing well and those really help us to have a core standard so coming back to values because you spoke a bit about values earlier Mm -hmm. so now we've looked at how we can stabilize and center ourselves ramping up mind body and soul and now comes a piece of being a bit more clear on our values I'm sort of thinking of this podcast episode as like micro coaching session for someone who might want to transition their career can they do these steps on their own of course 200% better with a coach. We both agree on this, but also can be done alone. So I'm thinking they can inspire themselves, ramp up the energy, and then comes the values piece. So how do you help people to discover what their values are and to start taking action according to their values? Absolutely. And I think I I share your, I suppose, understanding because it's not about secret squirrel for me. Like my goal and people laugh. My goal is to be 80 in coaching half day a week. That's my goal. So my it's the whole finite the infinite uh, infinite games, I suppose. My, the, the goal of the game, 
it's to keep it's to keep the game going basically it's not to like oh i sell this i have a big win i sell my business boom i'm gone i'm out you won't see me again that's that's not the point of it and if people get learning and my goodness actually get i suppose successes whatever they are for them based on what they hear from me what are they going to get working with me I think people completely think about it the wrong way. You know, sell sell the um, I suppose the, the secrets or share the secrets. Sell the implementation. That's that's what how I view coaching. I suppose. Um. So so on that that values piece, I think first and foremost, I had coaching myself to get to this place. Um. But what there are amazing values exercises out there. Um. I have a free one that I share as well. Um. That people can access. Um. In terms of value inventories and stuff like that, just to get the, the ball going. Um. But I suppose how people can kind of go through that process is understanding when things I suppose emotionally trigger them I would argue like I said before that it's often linked to a value and if I highlight that to how then utilizing those values in the future rather than being pretty words on a piece of paper how they actually have meaning I suppose in terms of my my future direction I can kind of share my my, my own I suppose so mine clearly I suppose I have four values they're often three or four words it's not set you know you can have as many as you want but often three or four because they're the core fundamentals of your being mine are uh, freedom um, fulfillment lifelong learning and integrity and for those who are in the self-development space they can probably see why I'm in the coaching space based on those values so kind of me freedom first and foremost is freedom both physically so I'm speaking to your, your lovely self today. I could be in South Africa. I could be in Jamaica. And I have freedom to do what I want to do to a certain extent. I have that autonomy. So freedom and control, whatever word kind of speaks to you, is incredibly important. And I make that, uh, I suppose, a key factor in the decisions I make going forward. It's also freedom in terms of financial freedom. I've already linked to about my past upbringing and my childhood and how I can hopefully do that for my children, God willing, when they come, um, to give them what I call cultural capital. So what's important to me, my wife, and I think in turn my children will be experiencing the world and the cultures and how lucky we are to be born in the UK, um, as opposed to other countries as well, I'm sure. But, but to be born into a, a country that doesn't have to, I suppose, go through some of the things we see in the news on a day-to-day -day basis so that's a massive piece that's freedom and again you can see they're not just pretty words there's some real emotion and passion involved in that word that will then implicate my future actions fulfillment clearly i get to wake up with the sole purpose to inspire people to do what inspires them now i would argue there's not many more fulfilling things i can find in the world when i get to do that so the sunday scaries are no more for me because you know, I can feel even my skin crawl when I say, like, I, it gives me so much energy to, like, see that little light bulb moment in someone's head. And you know you've had a positive ripple effect, not just on them, but their family and their, their kind of wider community. So it, amazing, fulfilling profession. Lifelong learning. Anybody, any coach who says they're perfect and they know everything, run the other way. <laughs> get your running shoes on and dart. That's what I would say. Um, I When I'm 80, touch wood, and I'm still doing this half day a week. I will still learn things every single day with every single client. I will never be perfect. So also how you can see this applies to personal circumstances where I love golf. I can never be perfect at golf. It could be rain, it could be snow, it could be sun. I'm always learning new things. So it doesn't just apply to a professional capacity. It can apply wider as well. And then finally, I suppose, uh, integrity. So I have a, you know, whether you believe in all the suns and the moons, I am, a, a, you know, an Aries. I have a deep injustice with the world and, and fairness and trust and all of that stuff. And what might be trust or transparency or loyalty to someone, the word integrity is the one that's most important to me. So I like to do like long term games with long term people. So and to do that, really, you need to have a deep sense of integrity in terms of how you act um, and equally. People who come to coaching are presenting themselves in a vulnerable space and not to take advantage of that. You know, it's amazing how we've seen the growth of the coaching industry absolutely boom. And obviously there's the, 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 there's good and bad things with that, I would say. And a big piece for me to stand out from the crowd is that amongst other things is that piece of integrity. And when you do enough podcasts or people speak to you, you can only say so many words. People get the sense of their, your personality and your integrity and the actions that you take. So that's like a real practical way of how I've utilized my kind of values to like uh, do my future kind of direction and, and the decisions I take. Um, for, for me, I've been on a process and not to say that your actions can't change over time. There might be another big life event, you know, my parents or someone might pass away that's quite close to me. That might often have a change in terms of how my values represent themselves. But I would say at a fundamental core, they're not things that change, you know, over days or weeks. They're often things that stay for a season of your life. Um, and that's, I suppose, how I've kind of come from through doing values exercises, working with coaches, understanding the, the meaning behind the word. And then ultimately, 
and practically how does that value kind of uh, go forth into the future in terms of my, my actions and decisions it's what you said about values when you started at the beginning of the episode that they're not just buzzwords that sound good and look nice they really are a compass for how we act and when we start to see the world through that lens and start to realize that some of our values are maybe being neglected. So for instance, if we take the example you just said, lifelong learning, for example, fantastic. That I, I called mine curiosity. I know someone else yep. has called it growth, learning, yep. same thing. <laughs> Different words, same idea. Learn stuff, continue till the day you die. That's it. And <laughs> it, pretty much. <laughs> and so I, if I think of, of, of behaviors and in, in, for instance, a work environment or circumstances, I think if, for instance, you're in a job or work where you don't feel you're learning as much as you'd like to, and it goes against this value of lifelong learning, if you haven't gained clarity that it is a value for you, if you don't fully understand this about yourself, it will be harder to see why you're not finding the job fulfilling. And I'm speaking from my own experience, because when I worked as an engineer, it was quite adventurous, I had some fun, it was on the boat, I traveled, and there was a time where it was just, bah. <laughs> And I didn't yeah. know what that was. And I was still listening a bit to podcasts sometimes as I worked. So I was still learning a bit, but it was engineering. So micro bits here and there of learning specifically applied to the job, but not overall learning and not things on the topics that I'm really passionate about, like psychology and self-improvement and leadership and high performance, because I didn't know back then that those were the topics I was interested in, although I yeah. would have been back then had someone told me about these topics, I would already have found it interesting. I just didn't know about them. And so what I'm thinking now is, had I been clear back, back then on my values and how important learning was for me, I would have either changed career sooner or, or just implemented more learning. And I think I knew this on a subconscious level because I remember at one point taking like an Italian book with me to teach myself Italian while I was on the boat or taking these big classics or bits and pieces here and there because I obviously wanted more mental stimulation but I hadn't defined it. So I think when you define this with your clients and they really see their values and they see how maybe one, two or all of them are not respected in their current work environment, that's when the light bulb moment appears. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, and I love, again, your, I suppose, your point around how can we integrate them into what we do as well? So it's not always kind of jump ship, I suppose. Sorry to have that pun, <laughs> chuck the pun in there. Um, but uh, it's always about jumping ship. I suppose for me, a lot of the work I do is obviously helping people with their careers, but it, it goes two ways. I do a lot of development of people's careers, I suppose, internally in the industry or their company, and also career transitions. That's just one piece of the puzzle for me. And a, a lot of the people, when people say, oh, your favorite client, clients you've worked with or give us a story rather than giving the generic one of I helped x move from you know from their place to y I actually quite like the ones when I've helped people realize actually just where they are and how powerful the position they're in and actually utilize their position and integrate their values whether it's practical learning or whatever it is in terms of projects and volunteering um, and realize actually how much joy can be had in their role but they're just underutilizing it so that that's a big piece for me in terms of whoever I serve, whether you're in the army, you know, you're leaving the army, whether it's the NHS, whether you're in a professional world in terms of accountancy, wherever it is, it's it's having a bit of a, I suppose, an independent and objective viewpoint when I kind of coach people and seeing how best we can meet those values. And like I said, it's, it takes two to tango. You know, I need people to, I suppose, support me along that journey in terms of the client, but it's not always jump the ship and run elsewhere. It's also how can we integrate that especially in the stabilizing place if we can integrate values even what say none of those values are being met and we can integrate even one of those values in like the next week that's going to give you just a 10 percent more energy to carry on in your current place and if you get positive effects and a big piece for me is how can i implement a quick win with a kind of client so then they gain more trust in me then more trust in the process the more safe and trust they feel the more challenging i can be the more transformational i can be and it's a nice it will revolve in circle as well so yeah I, I love your point about how can you implement them not just moving elsewhere but but where you occupy now as well okay we're already approaching like the last few minutes of today's episode and i'm thinking we've gone through stabilizing centering yourself rising mind body or soul we've looked at how values a uh, fundamental compass to find out which direction to go in and also to see if your work is currently aligned what would be one last tool you would recommend for people if 
maybe they're not satisfied in their career and it's either that they need a career transition or that they need to grow and change something in their career what would be one tool you would recommend them to sort of conclude oh, today's episode absolutely absolutely I, I i think there's two ways i could take this but I, i'm going to say find find you in three years time so if you have an initial understanding of different paths that you're interested in you might not have gone full in in terms of where you want to go I like find you in three years time. So say I want to be a coach um, and I wouldn't necessarily go straight to Tony Robbins and have a one-to-one -one conversation. I mean, I probably would anyway, but in terms of like, he, he's been there, he's done it. He's like 20, 30 years in the profession. And I, I could argue that he might be a little more removed. I mean, you know, than where the first person is when they first start their business or their practice. So you don't have to just do this with one career. I did this with my own career transition. So I also uh, work in, uh, in a role in terms of supporting universities with the graduates and postgrads with their future careers as well. So I and I went and did my coaching practice to build the skills to allow me to represent myself well to an employer. So I'm not like a complete, you know, fish out of water. I've got kind of thing, you know, if I can work with the Tate and help people, you know, I can probably work with your company and help your students. Um, a big piece of that, it, it, I suppose, is it's showing, um, oh, I've just lost my thought. Of, look, my, but that's it, my pathways. So I, I, I approach people who are career coaches or uh, career officers or career consultants at university establishments that were like three years in their career. And I had about three or four different Zoom meetings with all of those different people. And within about a week, I knew very clearly this was the path for me. Now, even if you have a couple of interests, it doesn't mean you're going to say, right, that's it. I'm giving it up. I'm going to be a civil engineer or going to be a veterinary surgeon. If you have these initial conversations, you can kind of try before you buy in a safe environment and then understand what's the reality. So that's what a lot of my try to do with my podcast. You see something looks pretty, but what's the reality of that career? What do you do day to day? What's the learning, you know, learning requirements? What's the financial capacity? And then you can very quickly realize if you want to take another step in that direction. Doesn't mean you have to jump in and you're going to do it, but then it will allow you to put more energy, more time into that place. So for me, as soon as you get a couple of ideas, a couple of interests, don't worry. It doesn't matter if you feel like you've wasted time because you haven't, you've then cut off a career. So for me, I, I did a county internship, hated it, knew I don't want to do accountancy. So now my search goes from here to here. So it's perfect. So for me, find you three or five years ahead, and that will give you the real insight, the real data, I suppose, in terms of, is this something I want to put more energy into? Is this a, a pathway that I want to pursue? Um, because that helped me, I suppose, in the practical sense as well. Amazing, this is so valuable. And I think for people listening, if they're in a career mm, transition or not fully satisfied, they can really follow this and, and apply it. And you gave a very clear overview at the beginning with elevate your own energy, then be clear on what is important for you, find out your values and your compass, then start looking at direction. And then, like you said, in terms of action, which is what you just shared right now, try things out a bit, talk with different people in those career three years down the line and see if it's a good fit. So very clear framework. Thank you so much, Michael, for being on the show and sharing all of it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for your time, Katie.